Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a recorded session. Uh, just to keep in mind that all materials that we share uh, on this uh, webinar will be made available uh, after this after today's session. Uh, again, uh, participants, please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself, your organization and country that you're joining in. Um, my name is Maureen Penjueli, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, the webinar title for today is Whose Digital Future? Writing the Digital Rules in the Pacific. Um, while the digital economy holds much promise for us here in the Pacific, there are still major structural hurdles with basic electricity and connectivity issues for communities to be able to use online technologies. Despite this, there is a rush to write legally binding rules for the digital economy, with major players looking to lock in their comparative advantages and to lock others out through a range of agreements. Our esteemed panels, uh, panelists this afternoon will discuss key issues associated with the digital economy and data value, the look at who's writing the rules, how are the rules being written, and how for us here in the Pacific, Indigenous knowledge is being valued and how it needs to be protected in a digital world. Um, to kick us off this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Anita Gurmutie. Um, she is a founding member and executive director of IT for Change, where she leads research and advocacy on data and AI governance platform regulations and feminist frameworks on uh, digital justice. Anita contributes regularly to academic and media spaces. Um, she currently serves as an expert on various bodies, including the United Nations Secretary General's 10-member Group on Technology Facilitation, Council of the Platform um, Corporatism Consortium at the New School in New York, and has been on the Paris Peace Forum's working group on algorithm uh, governance. Um, this afternoon, Anita will just take us through a general overview of digital trade, what the key concepts are, key ideas at the heart of digital trade, data, data flow, and how that is pursued through free trade agreements. Anita, you have about 10 to 12 minutes. And um, just our panelist, um, feel free to start inputting questions into the chat box uh, as Anita is speaking, and we will go through those at the end after each speaker has spoken. Naka, Anita. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, with issues such as this one, especially when we are mapping our futures in relation to data, uh, there will be more questions than answers. So permit me to learn from you and uh, hopefully I will have something to contribute. Uh, I'm also given 10, 12 minutes to do like a quick uh, tour of uh, a domain that's very, very uh, vast and growing. Uh, but I know that uh, people and my colleagues who will speak after me are going to bring in uh, their vast uh, repository of wisdom. So I will do uh, yeah, a little bit and then we can move forward in the discussion. Um, we know that the next ministerial of the WTO is around the corner, and we also see that the joint statement initiative on e-commerce is moving forward. And uh, just to say that there are several joint statement initiatives. This one is under the co-convenorship of Japan, Australia, Singapore, and other countries. And what it essentially means is that, that there is a subset, you know, there is a subgroup of WTO members uh, that are uh, talking about e-commerce and this includes uh, the world's uh, major economies including the US, the European Union, indeed China, uh, UK, Japan, uh, Canada, Brazil uh, uh, and others. And what we know now uh, and at the point at which this uh, webinar is happening um, at least is informed by uh, leaked text and uh, you know it seems to suggest that Considerable progress over time has been made in terms of the points of contention, and but some do remain, and broadly these concern uh, the governance of cross-border data flows, you know. So this is uh, like one of those terminologies that has become 
uh, extremely important to understand. And uh, there are other crucial issues on electronic transmissions, data localization, source code, um, among a few others. Uh, what we see is that it almost feels like um, the White Queen and Alice, right? You're standing in the same place and you're running farther and faster and faster. But in some ways, you're also taken back to the uh, 2017 moment of the Buenos Aires, uh, you know, when initially the e-commerce agenda came very, very prominently. And since then, I think we need to understand that countries have moved in their positions. One is US, Canada, Australia, and a few others, including Singapore in our region, are batting for unrestricted uh, cross-border data flows. Brazil and China, you know, uh, uh, slightly different uh, in their positions, geopolitically very different. They are batting for jurisdictional sovereignty and for the inclusion of a proviso which will allow for data flows unless otherwise provided in their own laws and regulations. We know China has a very strong domestic uh, digital economy with its own players. And Brazil is not quite like China, but it is also looking to the future also because of its G20 presidency, you know, which is being handed over from India. And the whole idea is that they want to strongly focus on AI regulation, which is an important agenda in its G20 presidency, and also look at concerns at Maureen flag, which include access, local language, etc. And these therefore become important caveats to the liberalization of cross-border data flows in the context of Brazil, which is very different from China, the entry points in, into the debate. The third position is the classic European Union position, which has again moved, and I'll come to that shortly, which um, uh, the position says that data flow shall not be restricted by various localization requirements for processing of data. This position is the European Union idea that you know privacy is important, G GDPR is important, the Digital Services Act actually prevents many things, including targeted ads, um, you know, which are looking at uh, children as an audience. So all of these are parts of the human rights uh, aspects that the GDPR and the European Union's value systems want to promote alongside the flow of uh, data. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about cross-border data flows, right? Um, Today, development sovereignty, you know, the whole right of people to self-determination is predicated on data sovereignty. Aggregate data is a very important, it's a vital economic resource. And um, the fact that it is an economic resource does not automatically mean that it has to be commodified in the very uh, neoliberal way in which we see it being commodified. A resource, as we know, from uh, the lives of indigenous peoples, from the lives of fisher folk, from the lives of peasant communities in the region, this uh, indicates to us that there are other means to manage resources. For instance, common ways of managing resources, right? But today, in this entire hype around chat, GPT, large language models, where it seems like reams and reams of text have made the made way into providing insights into how human minds can think, there are other things that get completely forgotten. For instance, foundational artificial intelligence models, which are emerging uh, as vital in manufacturing, in biotechnology, in production processes across services across agriculture, supply chains, logistics, etc. One important axiom of the economy today is its increasing servicification, which means the share of services to the total GDP is increasing. And this is because technology and globalization have come together and it allows us to enable new forms of economic activity to emerge in the economy. So you have chatbots telling you what to do uh, in the after sales segment um, of uh, production and consumption, right? So developing countries find themselves in, in a very, very sticky spot. They are relegated to the bottom segments of this economy, servicified, servicifying economy, data economy, and they're caught in low value loops. You know, their skill sets are often relegated to, you know, very educated and qualified people just, um, tagging images for AI that will be produced elsewhere, you know, so this is the large uh, 
sets of uh, youth, you know, whose destinies seem to be tied to AI economy that is really uh, creating the code that is, uh, you know, uh, creating the intellectual property in the developed countries, whereas the labor is coming from our countries. And in many ways, therefore, developing countries become importers of digital services, and they're not able to make good or reap the benefits from the wealth of data resources that could be managed for their own domestic economic development through models that are homegrown in the form of, let's say, commons-based management, city-based controls over data sets, uh, ideas of communities of peasants, communities of producers that have control over the data. Uh, how much more time do I have? Five minutes? Or maybe two to three minutes left. Two to three minutes. All right. So what I want to say is um, there is a certain control of that of our economies through platforms. These large platforms that control our destinies, whether it's consumption of entertainment or it is uh, search engines or it is social media, are not the sum total of the economy. The sum total of the AI economy includes every single sector, entire societies and economies. And this phenomenon is now understood as the infrastructuralization of platforms. This is structural power. This is infrastructural power. I want to end with a couple of points. And um, I really hope that Sanya and others will be able to take on this moratorium on e-commerce. I've not been able to speak to it. The question here is, should the data flow? It's an existential question. Is it good if data flows? Is it bad? Well, we are caught in this trade paradigm, but each country, you know, in a trade in a trade paradigm, we are told that anything that flows is good, free flows is good, right? That's the premise on which trade is uh, built, and so for good or for bad, you know, willy nilly, we are in this uh, paradigm where data is already flowing. That's the de facto. But every country needs to determine its own competitive advantage. We need to determine, for instance instance, India has reversed its stance, you know, from a whitelist of where data can flow, which countries data can flow. Now we have decided, uh, policymakers have decided a blacklist approach, that they will go with a data flows paradigm in which we will have a blacklist of which countries data cannot flow to. So that's, um, in the past, I would say just two to three years, you know, even during the RCEP, India took a very different position. So countries are evolving their position. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is seen to have nothing to do with data flows, but it has everything to do with European interests, Chinese interests in the African Union and its own data policy framework, the single market framework. So we have to be very careful. The EU is full of paradoxes. While it wants localization for itself, it may not want data sovereignty for other countries. And finally, I want to point to the fact that this is certainly the flows of data is not just a trade issue. It has national security considerations. It has public policy considerations for what is a level playing field for MSMEs. What about anti-discrimination uh, through algorithmic control, which I'm sure Sanya will speak about. And what about the way forward? So here I want to conclude in a minute that we have to go probably with both a negative and a positive agenda. Our bottom line is do not negotiate data and trade agreements. We really need other fora. And the UN is thinking about a global digital compact in 2024. And at the 2024 milestone, the UN is going to call for, the Secretary General has proposed that we have to have a decade of data. We have to have a global data compact. And I think there is a great urgency for countries like ours to move on this so that there are some basic rules. And in the meanwhile, I think countries in the region will have to bat for public financing for data infrastructures, our own data infrastructures where autonomy to control our infrastructures exists. Because today, the debate in the WHO, the debate in the Committee on Food Security in, under the FAO, all of this is calling for why don't we all pool more and more resources into the global data commons, which is nothing other than a corruption of the word, the term commons and the commoners, right? Because all this data that is going into global pools is making its way into global pharmaceutical industries and other spaces 
from where the benefits for the original sources of the data is really an open question. It's, it's a moot point and there is absolutely no rule to ensure freedom from harm and guarantees of benefits. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. There's quite a lot in that 12 minutes um, that you've just laid out for us. But I think I'm just going to pick up on your central message, which is do not negotiate data in trade agreements. And pr probably that's a very good segue um, to lead into Sania Reed-Smith. Um, she's a legal advisor and research senior researcher at the Third World Network, where she analyzes the implications of trade and investment agreements on developing and least developed countries. Um, she con currently looks at negotiations at the WTO, free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. Um, and she's joining us really briefly today to talk about what's happening at the WTO and perhaps to look at, maybe speak a little bit about this, this global data compact and Indo-Pacific economic framework which Fiji is probably the only Pacific country that is part of this trade agreement. Um, Sania, over to you. And just to remind 10 to 12 minutes, apologies that it is such limited time for each one of you. Thank you very much uh, for this time and for inviting me. So um, I wanted to talk about the rules that are being proposed in this area as opposed to kind of e-commerce, the concept per se, because when we think about e-commerce, we think about buying and selling things online. You know, can you go onto Amazon if you have electricity and internet access and buy a box of tissues or download an e-book or watch a movie from Netflix? If you're an MSME, a micro, small and medium enterprise in the Pacific, can you sell your products on Amazon? That's kind of e-commerce, the activity. But what we're talking about today is what are the rules that are being proposed in international negotiations like the World Trade Organization or the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework or maybe some of the free trade agreements in the Pacific that can restrict your ability to regulate in this area. And you'll see that it's very broad. It's not just what you might think of as e-commerce, but it goes into a lot of other areas. So I think uh, there's some slides that somebody is kindly putting up. Um, thank you. And so um, basically, without these any of these e-commerce rules, e-commerce is doing very well. You know, there's 26.7 trillion in sales in 2019 without it. And how could you get these rules in the Pacific, um, these digital rules? So some of them are these provisions apply to all WTO members. So the Pacific Island countries who are in the WTO are already bound. Some of them are via this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And so far only Fiji out of the Pacific Island countries is participating. Some of them, there's a plurilateral optional e-commerce negotiation in the WTO called the Joint Statement Initiative, which I understand the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy suggests um, PICs join, and I think Adam will be talking about that. Um, or you might get it through some of your free trade agreements. So on the next slide, um, you can see that for all WTO members, so obviously this is Fiji, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Vanuatu, um, there's already a temporary ban on the ability to put tariffs or customs duties on electronic transmissions. For example, downloading an ebook from Amazon, a movie from Netflix, songs from iTunes. And that is in exchange for the TRIPS non-violation complaints, which we can talk about. But this is not enforceable and it's temporary. It's coming up for renewal again next year. And it's interesting to note that least developed countries like the Solomon Islands are not supposed to have to reduce, move their tariffs during this current development round of negotiations in the WTO. Nevertheless, they are banned from imposing tariffs on these kinds of things. And it is quite feasible to be able to impose these tariffs. Australia does it, for example, for a value added tax. They just say to Amazon, if it's an Australian citizen who is downloading an ebook from Amazon, when they click checkout, add the value added tax. Amazon collects the tax and sends it to the Australian government. So they could do the same tax, but currently banned. So um, as you can see from this slide, it's basically the developed countries who are the exporters of this, you know, Hollywood makes the movies and they want to export them with zero tariffs so that people in PG, PNG and Fiji download them. But developing countries like Fiji are net importers of these products. You know, there's not a big film industry in the Pacific Island countries and they can lose significant amounts of tariff revenue from um, not being able to impose these um, tariffs. As you can see, there was a calculation by a United Nations economist that Fiji lost 9 million US dollars in potential revenue in 2020 alone from this temporary ban. But remember this, this ban is only temporary. 
It only applies to the WGO members. It's not currently enforceable, but they are trying to make an enforceable permanent version of this through the optional plurilateral e-commerce negotiations called the Joint Statement Initiative. And that's the one that all the Pacific Island countries are being pushed to join um, by the e-commerce strategy that Adam will be talking about. Unfortunately, there was no data for the other Pacific Island countries to see how much um, tariff revenue they are losing or foregoing through this moratorium, but perhaps the governments themselves have calculated this. The next slide shows um, an earlier version of this calculation, which breaks down how much um, developing countries as a group are losing compared to developed countries. And you can see that developing countries are losing more revenue from this th than the high income countries, because generally developing countries have higher tariffs. It's an easier way to collect revenue than a value added tax or an income tax or a corporations tax. Okay, on the next slide, um, there are many other provisions that you might be asked to agree to um, if Pacific Island countries join this optional plurilateral e-commerce negotiation in the WTO that has no legal mandate or through free trade agreements and so on. And one is leaving it to companies to decide how secure electronic transactions are. But companies often don't choose a secure enough level. For example, if you use your um, credit card to go shopping in a supermarket like or a, a department store like Target. Target takes your credit card number, they send it to their head office unencrypted. That means anybody could steal it and go shopping with your credit card. But Target doesn't bear the costs of that. It's the bank or you who have to pay for that. So what we find is even in developed countries, the companies don't make these transactions secure enough. So the governments have to mandate that credit card data is encrypted in transit or your ID number or um, you know the banking online banking website must be encrypted with a HTTPS. Um, or your oil and gas pipelines must be encrypted and have a certain level of cybersecurity because otherwise they can be hacked. And that has happened in many countries. People lose money. You know, the pipeline was shut down when it was hacked. Um, but also for interoperability, for example, in the US, they say that hospitals and insurance companies must use the same IT system so that the insurance company doesn't have to retype all the hospital records when they get them faxed to them or sent by mail or something. Those things are not possible because you have to leave it to the companies to decide what kind of electronic transaction system they want to use. Maybe there's an exception for one category and you choose which one you want to save. Um, the second provision there is about non-discriminatory treatment of digital products. This has a lot of implications and some of them are listed in that um, paper. And it's about, for example, on the app stores, the Google app stores or the Apple app stores, um, trying to break those monopolies so that um, companies who sell their products on those app stores can use other payment systems and they're not forced to use the Apple one and so on. Or if you remember, there was the issue about um, newspapers in uh, Australia, for example, a lot of their advertising revenue was going to Facebook. So they had the Australian government passed laws that Facebook and Google have to give some of that revenue back to the newspapers. That kind of legislation um, to help newspapers survive can also um, fall foul of this non-discriminatory treatment. And that's explained in those papers. Then there's the data flow issue. So as Anita explained, data is very valuable um, and governments may want to keep it locally for a number of reasons, but companies um, want to have it themselves, right? And they want to have it for free. So for example, um, I think five, the, like the sickest 5% of the population is responsible for 50% of the health costs. So insurance companies don't want to insure them. So they've been going around and buying the records from the pharmacy. So they see, aha, Maureen goes to the pharmacy every week for asthma medicine. That must mean her asthma is not well controlled. She might be hospitalized. So let's not insure Maureen or we'll charge her more for her health insurance. Um, similarly, we see that the data brokers who have data on all of us, they they know there's a category, called, for example, called poor farmers or suffering seniors, and they sell that those categories of data to loan sharks who then target them for unaffordable loans. So um, in countries like Australia, they say that privacy is very important. So health data, your health records can only be stored in Australia rather than going to countries like the US where they have no privacy protection and they can be sold to loan sharks or health insurance companies and so on. In other countries, you might want to have requirements. I think, for example, in the PNG, there's requirements about what you can do about military data. Um, so in the US, for example, they say military data can only be stored in the US. It can't be stored in China or in Russia for security reasons. And for effective and 
information exists. If your banks don't store the data locally, they store it in some offshore server, as the US found in the global financial crisis in 2008. It was very hard to get that data to unwind the positions of Lehman Brothers when they collapsed, for example, before the stock market reopens. They couldn't figure out who owes money to who because the data was stored in Hong Kong, the IT servers were switched off, the IT people had gone home. So it makes it very difficult to regulate. In New Zealand, they require um, companies to store a copy of their tax records locally so that you can check if they're cheating on their taxes. You don't have to hope that you have a mutual legal assistance treaty with Ireland and get the data from them maybe three years from now if you pay a lot of money to the lawyers in Ireland. Um, there's also implications of cross-border data flows for digital industrialization and for micro, small and medium enterprises because, for example, 50% of online shopping starts on Amazon.com. If somebody's going to go, buy, go and buy an umbrella, they go directly to Amazon and they search for umbrella. And Amazon knows if you buy an umbrella, you might also want to buy a raincoat. So they suggest to you raincoats to buy. So 30% of Amazon sales come from this recommendation engine. How does Amazon know what people like to buy? Because they've sucked the data from the whole world, including Pacific Island countries, and that's how they make profits. But then Amazon can use that to squeeze MSMEs because MSMEs have to sell on Amazon because that's where the shoppers are. So then they can charge 30, 34% fees on sales. And then the MSMEs go bankrupt because they can't afford to pay that fee to Amazon, but they have no choice. They have to go on Amazon because Amazon Amazon is so dominant. So on the next slide, um, there's also um, restrictions, for example, in the JSI e-commerce, and it may come up in IPEF. A lot of these provisions are likely to be in IPEF. We don't know what's in IPEF. Um, Fiji is negotiating it. The text is secret. Um, but based on uh, what the US companies have asked for, which is the US-Mexico-Canada agreements, digital provisions, um, these are some of the, what I'm talking about today, are also likely to be proposed in IPEF. So Fiji and any other Pacific Island countries who join it would face these. So this is about protecting source code, which is is um, the software that human beings can read and the algorithms. For example, if the Australian New Zealand Bank branch in Fiji has an algorithm that says, we only give loans to people with brown eyes, uh, blue eyes because they tend to be richer than people with brown eyes, so they're going to repay the loans, that's the algorithm. And then the source code is the computer software that turns it into yes, no, do you get a loan? So this is actually stronger intellectual property protection um, than the World Trade Organization requires and least developed countries like the Solomon Islands are not supposed to have to do any intellectual property protection until they graduate from being least developed, but this already goes beyond it. It's a restriction on performance requirements for investors and it can restrict the ability to regulate in a lot of areas, those listed there, and I'm happy to talk in more detail if you're interested. But even if you have some exceptions as has been proposed in recent trade agreements, as you can see in the next slide, um, this is just to show you that um, in the next slide, the exceptions have changed over time as governments realized they forgot things. And as the use of algorithms expanded, they realized, oh dear, we better add exceptions, but they didn't go back and change the earlier ones. But even if you get the best exception, say from the Japan-US digital trade agreement, it still doesn't allow governments to do things like require technology transfer, say for climate change technology, solar panels or windmills, which is obviously important to Pacific Island countries. If it has any software in it, you can't require technology transfer. And we know that companies don't transfer technology out of the goodness of their heart. It also has a number of other implications that we can talk about, but this is just to show you that this is a fast moving area. You know, um, big data is being used more widely, algorithms are being used more widely. And so governments are rushing to sort of running to catch up with their regulations. So these rules restrict the ability to regulate in an area where you don't know what regulations you will need next year, next month, next week. So these trade agreements can be out of date before they come into force, but then it's very difficult to go back and change them and update them and broaden the exceptions because you have to get all the participants to agree. Either, for example, for the TPP and CPTPP, they didn't go back and add these exceptions that are in the later trade agreements. So on the next slide, uh, I'm conscious of the time, nearly finished. Um, this is some of the other things that are proposed in the JSI e-commerce. There's a lot of other things, you know, that could affect, you know, um, any state-owned telecommunications companies that still exist in PICs. Um, but in the name of e-commerce, there are also proposals to liberalize, to remove tariffs on imports of information technology products by joining these optional plurilateral agreements, the ITA 1 and 2, that no Pacific Island countries have joined so far. And of course, when you do that, you lose tariff revenue because you can't impose tariffs on you know, these IT products anymore. 
um, and it can worsen your balance of payments. And of course, least developed countries like the Solomon Islands are not supposed to have to reduce or remove tariffs at all in the current development round of negotiations in the WTO. Um, and there's a paper there explaining that. In the name of e-commerce, this plurilateral JSI e-commerce also um, says that you should liberalize services in various sectors, including computer and related services. So um, there is a paper there by law professor Jane Kelsey about some of the implications of that. But if you think about it, I don't know if there's been an issue in PICs about people renting out their homes on, um, sorry, that must be my time is up, uh, on uh, um, Airbnb and whether that means that then there's not enough money for um, not enough accommodation for locals at affordable prices because it makes more money renting it out to foreign tourists on Airbnb. And so that's been an issue in a number of cities in developed countries, you know, like Barcelona and stuff where local governments have said, we're going to cap the number of Airbnb to make sure there's enough affordable accommodation for locals. Or I don't know if you had an issue with um, car, uh, services like Uber and Lyft in Pacific Island countries, ride sharing where um, taxi drivers may have paid a lot for a taxi license and then they can't compete with Uber and so on. And so in New York, the Uber drivers were committing suicide. Uh, sorry, the taxi drivers were committing suicide because they couldn't compete with Uber and they're taking out all these mortgages for their taxi medallion. So these could be computer and related services. If you liberalize it, you can't cap it. You can't restrict the amount of Uber to ensure that local taxi companies can compete. You can't restrict the amount of Airbnb to ensure affordable housing for locals and so on. There's also proposals to liberalize retail services. So that might be sensitive in some Pacific Island countries if foreigners can have all the shops in your country. And that can also um, have employment implications if it's a lot of foreign supermarkets rather than small shops. Um, there's a proposal to liberalize advertising services. So all the PICs are members and parties of the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which bans tobacco advertising. It requires you to stop ab allowing advertising of cigarettes and so on on television, radio and newspapers and so on. Um, but if you liberalize advertising, then you can't ban or restrict advertising of tobacco, alcohol, uh, weapons, gambling, unless you get exceptions. And we see that um, developed countries, although there is a health exception in the WTO, it's so difficult to use that they excluded things like tobacco and alcohol advertising when they liberalized advertising services. But in this WTO JSA commerce, they're saying liberalize all advertising so you can never restrict um, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, weapons, and so on advertising. And then lastly, they're proposing, um, one of the other things they're proposing in the JSA commerce is to do more trade facilitation. So this would be things like accepting electronic copies of customs paperwork um, and issuing it electronically, but um, all PICs have already had trouble implementing the existing trade facilitation agreement in the WTO, and it's expensive and difficult for the customs administrations to do all this, and they're being asked to do even more. So if you don't have, you know, electronic border posts in all of your islands with internet access, how are you going to comply with these kinds of things and without any um, assistance to do it? Then on the next slide, um, the exceptions that are proposed are very limited usually. It's just things like um, on the next slide, you'll see health and environment exceptions, but so difficult to use. They only work two out of 48 times. Sorry. Yep. And there's the necessity test, which fails 61% of the time. The privacy exception is self-canceling. So is the prudential one for financial regulation. Um, as Anita said, the EU is more concerned about privacy. So they have a better exception, but the US doesn't want it. Even legitimate public policy objective exceptions can be difficult to comply with. The security exception is up to the tribunal usually. If this is really for security reasons, the tax exception may not be a full tax exception. So um, on the next slide, I just give some links to further information. Um, and I put the USMCA text there because that seems to be what um, the big US multinational companies want as the basis for the IPEF digital provisions that Fiji is facing, that they're trying to conclude that by November this year, negotiations are every month, it's very intensive. Um, and so if, if governments think that these are good provisions to have, they can implement it unilaterally tomorrow. You, but if you lock it in in these trade agreements, then you can't reverse it if it turns out to be a problem the way that, for example, Malaysia found when they unilaterally liberalized retail services and they allowed foreign supermarkets in and the local shops closed down, they couldn't compete. But because Malaysia had not locked that in in a trade agreement, they could kick out the foreign supermarkets again and just say one per big city, you can't operate 24 hours a day. But if they had locked that in, for example, through the JSA commerce, then you could 
couldn't reverse it. So you can see many ministries and laws and policies and areas of regulation are affected by this, even though it's called, you know, digital rules or e-commerce, but in fact, it can affect ministries from health, agriculture, education, transport, industry, defence, justice, trade, intellectual property, your competition commission, your gambling regulators, you know, your car safety regulators. So it can have very broad implications. Sorry, I went so long. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sonia. But I think that was quite useful both to further elaborate on Anita's um, intervention and just a reminder to people, the JSI is a joint statement initiative. It's a subset of rich countries uh, that are pursuing this agenda, including our neighbors to Australia um, and this real push for Pacific Island countries to join this club. Um, thank you for going through what the implications are for Pacific WTO members. Uh, interesting to note that the rules uh, uh, really still constrain our government's ability to collect uh, custom duties and electronic transmissions uh, at a time when governments across the Pacific are in a debt crisis, really looking um, to buff up uh, collection of revenue. Um, that's the temporary loss of revenue is quite uh, particular. Um, but I think that really did also neatly uh, takes us to, so we've got a good bird's eye overview from the WTO. And now we just move to Adam's uh, presentation. And Adam is the co-deputy coordinator for the Pacific Network on Globalization. He's worked in the Pacific, has over 13 years uh, monitoring uh, negotiations at the bilateral, regional, and at the WTO level. He has a degree in economics and has worked with numerous environmental and trade groups in Australia. Um, he will be taking us a little bit closer to take a look at the Pacific regional e-commerce strategy. I think really paying attention to some of the key um, constraints and elements that are already coming down from the WTO and also from this joint uh, statement initiative uh, and what does it mean for us here in the Pacific? Adam, over to you. Great. Thank you, Maureen, and, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, it's been really interesting and I think, it, as Maureen said, it sets this up really nicely. Um, sorry, I have a presentation. So here. Uh, so I guess I wanted to talk about the regional strategy and when we're discussing it, I think the question is, it's a regional strategy to where? Where does where does this strategy take the Pacific and where does the Pacific want to go with it? And I think that's actually a really crucial question when like, based on everything that like Anita and Sanya have discussed, but um, when we I sort of discuss the strategy, you can see a bit more why that that question of where is this headed is is so crucial. Um, so when we were talking about the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy, and it's a strategy that was agreed in 2021. And, you know, it's sort of it's uh, associated with the Aid for Trade Strategy and some other regional instruments. Um, when it was launched, it was, you know, it was associated with a lot of the language that these things usually are. So it's like a game changer. It's going to solve the problems of distance for the Pacific. Um, all these sorts of things. And if we look at the vision of the strategy, it, it's, you know, it wants to, tr it's, uh, and it says from the strategy itself, is a transformative blue Pacific economy where all businesses and consumers actively engage in domestic and cross-border electronic commerce. And the, the, the vision is actually really central to it because when you think about what, all, all the complexities and all the dynamic aspects to digital trade and e-commerce it's not just consumers and producers you know and that that's one of the problems one of the issues that's at the heart of the strategy you know if you look at its overall outcomes that the strategy is proposing number one is more on online consumers number two is more on online businesses and the third is connected through a faster and more inclusive network so it's still framing everything about just trying to facilitate and find platforms to for consumers to meet businesses. And, you know, that that's well short of what the discussion really is. Um, you know, the strategy 
draws on the uh, framework for Pacific regionalism. And that's important because when you hold up some of those core principles against the strategy, we, we sort of find that it's quite lacking. Um, so when the strategy, within the strategy, there's seven priority areas. And these uh, are based on the, the UNCTAD's e-readiness assessment. So it's sort of building on existing processes that exist. But, you know, it's worth reflecting that those e-readiness assessments have been criticised or critiqued by, you know, UNCTAD itself as being too narrowly focused on um, this, you know, this idea that it's just about commerce. You know, it's just about buyers and sellers and connecting them. Um, I, so I'm not going to go through all the priority areas, but there's some I just want to flesh out, give a little bit more context to. Uh, the first one on a readiness and the strategy formulation, um, you know, it, it seeks to have national strategies, you know, relate to and uh, have coherence with the, the regional strategy, which is which is great. That's you know, obviously you want that sort of coherence, um, but it becomes problematic when the regional strategy is you know has issues and is too narrowly focused, as well. Um, and I'll talk about this later. The the governance structure has has quite a few questions and problems that if that's being copied from the regional level down to the national level, then those issues will sort of exacerbate. Uh, the second is on the ICT infrastructure and services. So the strategy itself basically paints uh, what well says the liberalization of telecoms has produced clear benefits in terms of connectivity. Like that's a very broad statement without really any evidence to make it well, to avoid the nuance of whether or not how accurate that is. But I think for the Pacific, the idea of promoting private-public partnerships to deal with some of these key issues around connectivity uh, needs to be treated quite sceptically, given that, you know, private companies want to turn a profit from the provision of these services. And when you have islands and communities that are often remote and geographically isolated, you know, it, it's quite uh, unprofitable to provide them with the same level of service that, you know, the, the capitals might have. And and I think when we're discussing a digital future, we need to sort of talk about this idea of connectivity as, as an essential service, as an essential piece of infrastructure. And do you want to leave that to, you know, a private company? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. On trade logistics and facilitation, this is usually about, facilitating imports into a country um and you know the, the the pacific needs to think carefully about how that how it accepts that sort of uh reforms and it's also based on this idea that the pacific can be this place where there's distribution and fulfillment centers or that the like sonia was describing like the ability to just go and buy something online and have it delivered to your door it might be the reality in in australia or the us or wherever else but in the Pacific, that's that's not the case. That's um, the other one on access to finance and e-commerce. This is a really complicated sec like issue, and I want to just touch here and and refer people to the report that Paying did with um, Dr. Kelsey from Auckland University because it goes into a lot more detail and it unpacks a lot of what the the concerns and worries are around um, that sort of issue. Or that that sort of area, but the, the the strategic priority I really want to unpack a bit more is this um, legal and regulatory framework. Now, on the one hand, this is just about you know when when you look at the UNCTAD e readiness assessments, this usually just looks at well, do they have laws around you know online privacy or you know how data is held or or you know there's sort of more fundamental aspects to it. Whereas in the strategy, it starts to push that. A step further and, and sort of saying, well, you know, you need to have laws that, you know, you need to have a framework that business is confident in. So, you know, and this is where we start to see the, the pushes for things like data localization, intellectual property, um, technological neutrality, which um, Sonia mentioned briefly. So we're seeing a push already down this path that, you know, what's already being, what's currently being negotiated in trade agreements. And the strategy then goes on to say that it's a challenge for the Forum Island countries that there's an absence of e-commerce content in the legal text of their free trade agreements. And I think this is a real big tell on behalf of the strategy because 
I don't think that's a challenge. I think the challenge on e-commerce and, you know, having a regulatory framework in the Pacific around digital issues isn't a lack of, a, you know, it, it's um, inclusion in, in trade agreements. It's a, there's a whole range of issues that need to be discussed and, and evaluated. So we see that the regional strategy is pushing this, this agenda. And so, you know, we can see that its strategic outputs include, you know, negotiating agreements and concluding them. We can see the, the measures uh, training up and putting laws in place to negotiate and implement FTAs. Um, you know, one of the other measures is the, the successful negotiation and conclusion of a regional e-commerce agreement. So it's quite a, a consistent and considered push, um, including even, you know, it's budgeted. There's US $1.2 million suggested. There's a, a deadline. There's a um, metric for how many countries they want to have implementing it to consider as it a success. So it's very, there's a very clear pathway for this. Um, and that becomes important when we look at the governance structure, because we can see here, at, you know, the forum trade ministers are the, you know, is the, the top of the pile. We have some other committees. And the role of, of the governance structure, pardon me, is to, is the timely and effective delivery of outputs and and the achievement of its outcomes. So when you're having all of the, the measures and the outputs that include a regional trade agreement on e-commerce, we have a governance structure that is um, committed to, to achieving those outcomes. And so that's, that's problematic in and of itself. And it gets worse with the Pacific e-commerce committee having two subcommittees, one being the private sector um, the second being the development partners, and it describes like the donor, um, the donor parties, the developing agencies and banks as the quote powerhouse of implementation. And what we're seeing is those same funders, those same countries and bodies that are promoting a very neoliberal um, agenda when it comes to e-commerce and digital trade. They are now in the, the governance structure and responsible for delivering on that. So, you know, Australia funded this regional strategy. They're now sitting on the committees to ensure, you know, that and the other donor agencies to ensure that it gets delivered. And that's highly problematic and puts the Pacific in a very difficult position. Um, there's also no civil society representation within the within the structure, meaning that we're still seeing this narrow view of what e-commerce and digital trade is. It's not about how it builds development in other areas. It's not about what it means for other sectors. It's just about businesses and consumers. And so, you know, we have this high level of structure and governance to try and conclude this agreement. We're seeing the geopolitical competition play out on on this terrain. So, you know, China, the EU, the US, Australia, New Zealand, they all have their this agenda, different different agendas within these um, within this sphere, and we're seeing that play out. So, the MSG FTA three includes e-commerce rules. Um, it's unlikely that it will come into effect, but it has these rules, has some flexibilities, but we can see very clearly that the language is. Has been influenced by the European Union. Um, within PACE Plus, while there's no e-commerce section, there's very broad commitments on um, services. So as a lot of the areas that Sonia mentioned, these will all come into play when you know this the application of technological neutrality comes in. So you know when we're talking about airport sales or advertising, like Sonia mentioned, like you can start doing this across the border very easily without having to be present. Um, and with the the joint statement initiatives that have also been flagged, you know, it, again, it, it advocates that the Pacific join these negotiations with very little rationale for why, um, and it doesn't even even raise the fact that, you know, there are legal issues that they're happening within the WTO. There are big further implications for development when you have powerful countries writing their own rules and asking them or pressuring others to join them. Um, I'm conscious that maybe I'm starting to run short on time, so I'll move through this pretty quickly. So, like I said, there's a regional strategy, there's national strategies and assessments. Um, they're largely being done in-house. So the same group that did the regional strategy is often 
authoring the national strategies with a lot of, at times, borderline cut and paste work happening. Um, but despite that, we're seeing a very mixed uh, desire or appetite at, at, at the national level for negotiating trade deals on e-commerce, um, yet it features so prominently within the regional strategy. Um, and I've included a link here, so if you're interested, you can look at the national assessments yourself. So it comes back to this question of, is this regional strategy on e-commerce fit for purpose? And like I mentioned, it, it envisions e-commerce solely about online commercial transactions, and it's not part of a broader uh, conceptualization of it as an integrated digital ecosystem. There's so much more that are so many more parts of our lives that are affected by the digital trade than just commerce. Um, it does fail this framework of Pacific regionalism, um, primarily because it, it's singular focus on commerce, but also because, you know, as Sanya and Anita mentioned, the issue of data sovereignty is so critical to this whole conversation. And sovereignty is a part of the, the framework of Pacific regionalism, but is not mentioned at all within the strategy. Um, it continues to just promote a like a model of, of e-commerce that's based on the existing and reinforces the existing asymmetries between the big companies and the big players in this region and just assumes that there's benefits from a trade agreement will materialize. Um, there's a number of options going forward. I'll just keep it brief here. Essentially, the point is other countries are doing really interesting, innovative uh, work in this area. So other regional bodies and groupings are, are thinking about this differently. They're not just going along with the way that Australia, New Zealand, the US and others are pushing. And I think the Pacific, the recommendation that we have is the Pacific explore this option and look for other countries to discuss and engage with and learn from what they've done. Um, and so maybe I'll leave it there. And this is, here's a link to the report that Pang and, and Dr. Kelsey uh, released last year. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, just a little bit conscious of time here. Um, our last but not least speaker is Dr. Frances uh, Koya Vakauta. Um, she's team leader, culture for development at the Pacific community based here in Suva. Prior to joining SPC, she was an associate professor at the University of the South Pacific, director of Oceania Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies. She's passionate about the role that culture can and should play as an enabler for sustainable development in the Pacific and was a traditional knowledge advisor uh, at the Biodiversity Beyond Areas of National Jurisdiction, Law of the Sea, negotiations. Um, Francis, I mean, you've heard from all the previous speakers, but, but this is where it really hits the ground. Um, where data, in particular, indigenous data, knowledge holders of Pacific knowledge, uh, the different forms of Pacific knowledge uh, that we have and hold, and this idea that uh, we need to digitize that, uh, a lot of this indigenous knowledge. Um, really just to invite you um, for the next 10, 15 minutes, really to, to share your um, some of your works from BBNG, uh, but also at SPC right now on what you see as some of the problems, um, maybe opportunities that is arising, particularly because of this e-commerce uh, trade liberalization, digital trade liberalization agenda that our countries are binding themselves off to uh, without resolving that central question, should data be flowing freely? Um, and whether we should still have sovereign control over data. Francis. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. And thank you to uh, Pang, the organizers, for the invitation. I really um, appreciated and enjoyed and learned a lot from the previous uh, panelists. So I'm looking forward to the recordings um, so that I can go back and listen a little bit more closely. Um, so my intervention today will focus on uh, the key issues around making informed decisions about information uh, systems, particularly around data sovereignty and the establishment of any form of database registry or repository um, related to traditional knowledge. So on the international platform, 
uh, the recent negotiations on the law of the sea, uh, BB&J, or the Treaty on Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction, did highlight for those of us involved that there are some real implications for traditional knowledge and about data sovereignty, who holds it, who owns it, who has access to it, and who uses it. And while the BBNJ has now been um, endorsed, there are these same issues are still being debated in the current WIPO negotiations on two treaties, one on the protection of uh, traditional knowledge and the second on the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. And within this uh, broader conversation, the discussion, of course, uh, relates to genetic resources um, and DSI. So for my intervention, I uh, presented in three parts. First, a really brief overview of the backdrop to traditional knowledge, assuming, and I'm, I'm making this assumption, of course, that there may be some uh, members in the audience um, who are not familiar or haven't followed the conversations uh, around the struggles of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge. So I provide a really brief overview of that. So when we begin to talk about digitalization um, and these registers, we have that full picture at the back of our minds. Um, and then second, I will uh, jump into the issue of information systems themselves and digitalization. And then finally, just a key, uh, a summary of some of the key issues for consideration by our uh, Pacific Island uh, members. So to get us started, we're taking a little bit of a step back and just thinking about the context of traditional knowledge. And I want to start off by saying the, the issues around digitalization of traditional knowledge are very complex. And for this reason, I'm asking us to step back so that we can zoom out and see the bigger picture and not just what's in the current frame. So we know actually what, what's at stake here. And when we zoom out, we have a better understanding of the way that we currently treat knowledge in the world today. So there are five uh, key points, uh, bullet points that I want to highlight here. First, we're all aware of the knowledge economy. Knowledge is power in our current uh, world order. It has currency and monetary value. And recognizing that context, traditional knowledge has been recognized as having tremendous commercial value. And because of this, it is now viewed as a resource, as a commodity. And as a resource, it is now vulnerable to a unique form of extractive industry where culture is commodified. Second, colonialism and Christianization, as we all know, resulted in culture and language loss in all indigenous communities around the world. And it's taken many forms of resistance, resilience, and struggle to hold on to those cultural values, stories, practices, and knowledges that we can access today. So in this context, we now have, of course, globalization, which continues to perpetuate this colonial view that the knowledge system of the developed world is of higher value. It was and is an inherently racist system, which assumes that indigenous knowledge systems are only valuable if we can repackage it. Repackaging our worldviews and our value systems to fit in the mainstream. If they exist outside of that external frame, then it has no value. Three, we all use the term traditional knowledge without recognizing that it is itself problematic. Many indigenous communities prefer the term indigenous knowledge systems. Traditional knowledge is an imposed terminology that makes sense to the non-indigenous world. When we use the term traditional or traditional knowledge, we are stripping or separating that knowledge from the sacred, the relational connectedness, that indigenous peoples have with their land and their sea, with place. And it isolates knowledge from those cultural characteristics that contextualizes our spirituality and gives meaning in the cultural setting. So essentially, we're talking about traditional knowledge or TK, quite distinct from the way that indigenous peoples view their own knowledge systems. It has been repackaged. It has been repackaged so that it can be absorbed into the dominant Western scientific knowledge base. 
And then we take it a step further when we package traditional knowledge and expressions of culture in one box. And then we say that traditional ecological knowledge about the environment must exist in a different box. And again, the only reason that we do this is because it makes sense in the, to the non-Indigenous mind in the Western framework. We are not doing this for our people. We do this in order to fit into the mainstream paradigm because we don't want to get left behind in the development space or game. So when our knowledge systems enter into the Western framework, it's now commodified and the Western notions of intellectual property come into play bringing with this value of individualism. And because our indigenous knowledge systems are collective and communal, they don't fit neatly into that box, that Western paradigm of intellectual property. And this is the main reason that it has been 23 years since the WIPO discussions began on the two draft treaties that I mentioned. More than two decades later, we are still in negotiations because you've got a square peg and a round hole. Several key um, global instruments do provide reference points for the rights of indigenous peoples as holders of traditional knowledge. So we make reference to UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the CBD Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, Nagoya Protocol, and of course the recently adopted BBNJ Treaty Agreement. So it's against that backdrop that we now enter this conversation about digital futures and digitalization, and it is already complex. Um, and so we find ourselves again on the precipice faced with more pressure to repackage our already repackaged knowledge systems yet again in a new way that we don't fully understand. And there is pressure to establish traditional knowledge registers, databases, and repositories. So on the one hand, databases are seen as a way of documenting and safeguarding culture. And on the other, it's seen as a, as a way to commodify knowledge so that interested external non-Indigenous parties may be able to access and utilize particular aspects of that knowledge. Positively, it might be seen as protection for knowledge holders who might be able to to participate in the design of the database or the register and in the monitoring of its use. And as a defensive approach, it can provide some mechanisms to ensure that third parties do not gain a commercial advantage by using and commodifying knowledge. So it provides that little uh, check and balance in place. But there are several concerns that, that I want to, to raise here. We need to be mindful that indigenous knowledge and cultural practice is dynamic and it changes over time. And it's transmitted, we know it's transmitted orally and captured in our various forms of cultural heritage, which also evolve over time. But in contrast, a database is a Western construct. It's a mechanism for documenting information and it makes certain assumptions about the nature of knowledge. And these assumptions don't match with those of indigenous peoples. We are only now beginning to think about what cultural security might look like for the Pacific. And in that context, when you talk about data sovereignty, when you talk about ownership, what do we mean? What elements of cultural security might capture uh, these critical conversations? So we know that there is an urgent need to establish appropriate access and monitoring systems and mechanisms to address those concerns um, that we have about non-knowledge holders gaining access to information in ways that might compromise or undermine the rights of the knowledge holders and their right to self-determine. There are also questions about traditional knowledge that was accessed in the past without proper consultation or permission from the knowledge holders and which might already be patented, copyrighted, licensed, and even in the public domain. And so this is the main reason why the indigenous world continues to engage and debate the issues on the WIPO Treaty, because we really are hopeful that they will provide some protection. The indigenous caucus um, to the WIPO intergovernmental conference held last year argued that as sovereign rights holders, indigenous peoples are more than just stakeholders. They highlighted three key principles for access to traditional knowledge that are relevant to this discussion on digitalization. These are free prior and informed consent, 
the principle of do no harm, and the right to access, remove, and correct information. They also made the point that if unpublished traditional knowledge is added to databases and information systems, it must be done with free, prior, and informed consent of the relevant indigenous community. In June this year, the 47th WIPO session of the Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property, Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge, and Folklore reiterated four key points. The first one is divergent assumptions about the public domain versus indigenous people's human rights. The public domain operates on a time-bound assumption, while indigenous knowledge and the rights of indigenous peoples is timeless and transcends generations, so it's transgenerational. Indigenous peoples have reservations regarding the use of databases. While they recognize that registers um, and repositories can play a crucial role in safeguarding, they cannot and should not be solely controlled by national governments. So this raises the issue of uh, management, establishment, and ownership of the databases themselves. Um, they are concerned about the misuse of, of these uh, registers and databases, particularly in regard to the potential for uh, free dissemination to third parties. And they're very clear that any documentation and recording or use of their knowledge must first primarily benefit their community. Um, but interestingly, they did highlight that there are some examples of positive shifts in trade agreements that recognize traditional knowledge is dynamic and evolving, um, that provides this exception for indigenous people to continue to innovate um, and create diverse content of their knowledges. And so taking this proactive approach demonstrates that, that you know, it isn't a closed case, it isn't all bad. There is opportunity to develop reforms where intellectual property regime can be achieved, but at the same time, we can maintain our indigenous identity and cultural sovereignty. So what does that mean for us thinking about digitalization? Well, it means that there are some benefits, but we do need to be very mindful uh, about some key concerns if we are interested in designing contextual fit for purpose uh, registers, databases, and platforms. And so some of the big items to pay attention to include the free prior and informed consent, of course, the mandatory access benefit sharing, uh, paying close attention to clarify the role of the state and the indigenous community of knowledge holders, especially with regard to permissions, access to knowledge, the use of, and of course, benefit sharing. There are questions that we need to answer around what happens when you have an externally held information system, such as institutional registers or repositories, or databases that are managed outside of the cultural community. Then, of course, the issue of national legislature and recognition of customary laws, which is a big one, a big debate, and the protocols for the treatment of knowledge misappropriation. So to conclude, where does that leave us? Well, we know that for many uh, Pacific, and I, again, I take a, a tiny step back and into the cultural space, um, and maybe this will, will help situate for some the real challenge that we face when, when trying to um, I guess, synchronize um, and find um, a common ground is really trying to, to understand each other's worldviews. So for many Pacific indigenous communities, time is seen as continuous in a very different way uh, to the way that it's conceptualized in the developed world or the global North. And so the indigenous cultural lens sees the past as being in front of us and the future behind. And because the past is in front of us, it is what we see and know clearly. And because the future is behind us, it remains uncertain. What we do know is that our future unravels through the present and it's grounded and dependent on the choices that we make and the actions that we take today. So we know that Pacific Island states do have that autonomy to choose if they want to establish um, their own traditional knowledge repositories but what we really need right now is more research. We need to find out what has worked, why, how, and what are some of the lessons from the less than successful attempts that have been made so far. 
we do need um, political will to develop the proactive legislature and mechanisms. We do have in the Cook Islands the Traditional Knowledge Act of 2013, Vanuatu Patents Act 2003, which really was a, a forward thinking um, early example that captures indigenous knowledge and knowledge holders. Um, and of course, the Vanuatu uh, Protection of Traditional Knowledge and Expressions of Culture Act of 2019. We do need the political will and resources to ensure that, um, that this is done properly, that we are considering all of the challenges and are able to maximize on the benefits. We do need to ensure that our indigenous communities are central to all of the decision-making about how their knowledges are transmitted, shared, accessed, and used, and that whatever mechanisms, policies, laws, processes that we put in place, we must ensure that they, the indigenous uh, Pacific communities, reserve the right to own their knowledge in perpetuity, and that they have the right to sovereignty and self-determination, and that they benefit from any non-customary use. Um, our countries need a lot of support to sustain their efforts in cultural mapping. Uh, Fiji, I believe, is the only country that has actually successfully completed the full cultural mapping exercise um, and has had many challenges along the way in, in trying to, from the IT tech side, in trying to design, build, and sustain a fit-for-purpose information system or platform for them. Um, so they, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the Fiji example for other countries. But definitely um, a lot of support is needed for the establishment of our locally led, driven and managed databases. Um, and so our regional and international agencies do have a key role to play here um, to ensure and prioritize the advocacy, the awareness, education and training around these areas of work. Um, what we do need to see more of are scholarships for a wide range um, of areas of specialisms that we'd like to see actually in the Pacific. So growing and garnering a larger pool of Pacific um, experts around um, cultural economy, cultural statistics, cultural heritage management, information systems themselves, and the impacts uh, that they have in uh, indigenous communities. And of course, IP laws. Um, so I think it's wonderful to see that the shift is already happening in development thinking in the region. And so when you look at the 2050 strategy, we also have the Pacific Regional Culture Strategy um, that really does show that we are beginning to prioritize um, culture and traditional knowledge. We know technology is here to stay and it's transformed our ways of thinking and being in the world, But we and we certainly don't want to be left behind. But there is still a lot of food for thought and still a lot of lessons to be learned. And so I just wanna conclude by really thanking uh, Pang for this opportunity. Um, and I couldn't help but, but think that we do need more of these spaces where we bring, um, where we really are able to bring together this trans and multidisciplinary approach to having these uh, conversations um, rather than constantly speaking in our own silos and speaking to the converted. So Maureen, uh, kudos to you and your team. Um, and I hope that I have uh, added some value to our discussion today, Malo. Uh, no, Francis, I think you've done a marvelous job in uh, grounding it back into Pacific Indigenous knowledge systems. Um, I think we started this webinar with questions. I think Anita's really loaded questions around should data flow freely, um, whether we need to be looking at homegrown management of this idea of commons, uh, whether we should be looking at public financing to build up our infrastructures um, from the bottom up. And I think it segues very neatly to your uh, critical reminder, Francis, at the end around the questions about the need to step back. Obviously, Adam and Sunny have done a great job to really remind us that even as we are taking a step back, um, to locate the discussions around Indigenous people's knowledge systems. Um, the multilateral level is moving at high level speeds with the next ministerial um, quite formidable. Uh, and this joint uh, statement initiative is really running um, 
quite contrary to, to some of the efforts that is to relook at what we need to do at the regional level. Um, so I think it gives us a really good idea to see uh, the qualify of what is our governments doing as opposed to cultural practitioners, knowledge holders, uh, quite a lot of us that may be embedded in that um, because we know that our governments are also heavily involved in the WTO uh, regional trade agreements where I think that's where things get even more complicated. Um, I know that there were two questions, but I see that they've been answered. Um, I think we've got only five minutes, so I'm going to double check again. Um, there is one question from Petero. Petero, can I ask if your uh, microphone can be enabled so you can ask this one question, and then I'll come back to all the presenters for your one minute, just your one minute uh, advice for all of us. Uh, Alma, is it possible to unmute Petros? Uh, if not, I will ask it. Uh, hello. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, sorry, I, I was. I just came across. Uh, um, uh, a video yesterday of um, a site on Instagram that was using um, AI generation to uh, circumnavigate some of the policies on Instagram regarding child protection. There was a site that was basically, um, how should I say, um, stitching together different faces and backgrounds of children and posting them up. Uh, in terms of uh, adding stuff and digitalizing um, maybe Pacific art, Pacific cultures and uh, traditions, how are we also opening the door for uh, AI generation to now also circumnavigate things like uh, intellectual property? Uh, when now you can just say it was AI generated uh, because it's it has so much more that it can now um, how should I say, take from and, and generate uh, whatever someone might want on the internet. Uh, I, I'm just uh, wondering about whether there's anything that is directly looking at, uh, at that, uh, how AI generation can influence this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anita, before I come to you to respond to that, can I just, I see one more question. Um, it's by Chope uh, Tarai. Uh, what risk could be faced by Tuvalu's plans to digitize the islands into the metaverse in the, its current climate efforts? Uh, and could the geopolitical offer of leverage for PICs to create some level of digital self-determination? So those are the two questions. I see Sanya and Anita. And perhaps Adam and Francis, you're welcome to input into those two questions as a rounding uh, of this session. Thank you. So if I can just go, because uh, I'll just jump in uh, very little time. I will, uh, uh, I'm not qualified to take, uh, I think the question on uh, the context of the Pacific Islands and, but I will look at the AI question. Um, I think the intellectual property question with AI is uh, tied to the geo-economic, geopolitical context in multiple ways, not least because of the large language models we've begun to see as, uh, you know, these extremely um, capricious tools that run on top of knowledges and then seem to encode them for uh, creating value elsewhere, you know, not just least because of this, but also I think because uh, we really have to understand whether knowledge generated uh, by, say, Uber of the city and its topography and the, the practices of consumers uh, who are citizens, you know, whose transportation modalities reflect uh, underlying implications for how transportation policy can be evolved. All these are intellectual property questions. Who owns the data? Who controls the data? And who takes away the... Uh, 
artificial intelligence related value systems um, and value chains that are generated from data. The second thing I wanted to say is that there is indeed, uh, you know, on um, images generated by AI and its ethics and morality, an older question that used to obsess everybody. Like, you know, you've seen these things, you know, a monkey drew something. So that was, uh, you know, it's a digital creation of a, an animal or if a digital creation of an artificial intelligent enabled robot. Now, who does the intellectual property of that, um, you know, generated art belong to? I think we used to be obsessed with these kind of questions. I think in some ways, thankfully, the tide has turned because we are asking the questions about the multiplicity of uh, subjectivities um, that get generated online and be nowhere to ourselves of, you know, our own realities, right? That's the real question, you know, what's really going to happen to the children, the rights of children? What's going to happen to the rights of indigenous people? What's going to happen when things get commodified out of context of the life worlds of people, right? So I think this Instagram page thing is going to be resolved also by countries taking their own positions about algorithmic regulation. And I, I think a global law on AI and the normative benchmarks plus national uh, regulation in the different sectors, let's say worker rights, can you exploit workers through wearables? You know, that's an important question for the AI economy. So sectoral legislation is very important at the national level. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Anita. Sanya, and then I'll come to Adam and Dr. Francis for the last responses. Yes, just add that. AI question. Um, so the source code and algorithms provision that I mentioned can restrict the ability to regulate AI because these um, digital rules often propose, often say that governments cannot check source code and algorithms. So you can't check the algorithm used to train an AI or used in an AI, or you can't require it to be transferred to somebody who could check it. And then the exceptions that they have are not broad enough, even kind of the broadest exception that we've seen in the most recent trade agreements would still allow, according to the US trade unions, the ability to kind of do a an industry-wide investigation, say, to um, look at the impact of this kind of AI on workers' rights or on, you know, the conditions in an industry or on, you know, how the news articles are ranked in your Facebook feed. Um, so as these algorithms and AI obviously get used in more and more circumstances and governments are running to try and catch up with their regulation, the problem is that these digital rules can restrict the ability to regulate in these areas, including artificial intelligence. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, Adam and Dr. Francis, one minute, perhaps. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'll start with a second question from Jope. The, I think if the Pacific wants to can be wants to be smart about it, then it will try in some ways to leverage the different sort of agendas that are being pushed. But I think it needs to be the, the critical part is it needs to be proactive in searching out other countries who are trying new new approaches and trying to partner with them as opposed to just playing off the China approach to the US approach and, and vice versa. Um, on Tuvalu, I, I I think it's really interesting and I think it comes back to the question of who holds the data and where is the data held, who has the sovereignty over it. And I don't think I know enough about it to really give much more of an in-depth response other than I think it's super interesting and it comes back to that central question. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Francis? Thanks, Maureen. Yeah. I'm just going to uh, respond to... It's a rose question because I'm mindful of time. Um, and I just want to say uh, to Petero and, and the other participants that this is what I was alluding to when I said that there is a, a complexity that we don't yet fully understand. And because we don't have that full understanding, we really don't know how to respond. Um, and if, you know, if I can just uh, maybe remind people of the, the drama that happened around uh, Moana, Disney's Moana, we haven't resolved anything around that. We know that there are some key issues um, about the way that certain stories and knowledge was captured. Um, and if we want to talk about excess benefit sharing, a lot of claims or complaints that uh, cultural communities were not uh, fully aware of what they were getting themselves into. Uh, similar situation around uh, the, um, I guess, uh, avatar 
and the degree of inspiration that it has drawn from a wide range of indigenous communities, including uh, New Zealand Maori. So we haven't even resolved that yet. And suddenly we have AI on our doorsteps, completely new, and we're still struggling with an ongoing challenge from the past. Um, so I don't have a concrete answer for you, except to say that um, we are mindful of the challenges. We are mindful of the new issues and, and problems that they present. But again, we simply don't understand um, technology to the degree that we are able to to frame a response. So a lot more work to do, definitely. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank all of our um, panelists. Uh, thank you, Sanya, Adam, Anita, and Francis, really for taking the time out. I really acknowledge that this is such a big topic. Uh, Anita, I know that this would take you three to five days, and Sanya, Oh, and 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 Francis of just unpacking this entire thing, and we did it in an hour and a half. Uh, thank you all for your generosity in sharing your knowledge and experience, the kind of cautionary tale about we need to step back. I think Francis' point is we don't know enough. We need to step back and we look at what our governments are signing us up on to, what packs that they are aligning themselves with. Um, this is just the beginning of a conversation and a dialogue. Um, I think Pang is committed to taking this further. Um, but for now, and to all of our attendees, thank you for making the time this afternoon um, to join us. Uh, all of the material will be made available. Uh, please do get in touch with us if you're interested. But our deepest thanks and gratitude from Pang and the team. Naka.